our chair sends his regards, Ross Whitney. Uh, about two weeks ago, his wife was doing something innocent, and she managed to do a lot of damage to her foot. So he's at home caring for her. So, uh, but I've organized this meeting. I was we, uh, Ross and I were working together on this, and so I'll, I'll step in briefly. Um, this whole thing got started by one individual sending me an email and asking me uh, a simple question. And he said, uh, when you master a recording, he was being very generous and assuming that I actually uh, engage in mastering, but, uh, <laughs> um, and you send it off to Spotify, do you send it in different uh, 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 Luffs, uh, uh, master levels? And um, uh, so I had kind of spun my wheels a little bit, because fortunately it was email, so he didn't see that. And then I tried to sound very intelligent when I wrote back. And I said, well, <clears throat> I rely kind of on gut instinct, and I do this and a bunch of other things and hope that when it comes out the other end of the chain, other end of the chain that it works well. And uh, shortly after we had that conversation, a CD that I had mastered, that I mixed, um, got some attention in the US and got compared to another release. And so I went to Spotify and created a little playlist and discovered that mine sounded somewhat wimpier than the other one that I was being reviewed against. Now, still, the reviewer still liked our CD, so we, you know, we, we survived that. But that really drove home that I need to pay attention to this. And I suspect that there's more than a few of us in the world that are in the same boat, but I don't know that for sure. So the, the question itself, Alan will expound on. And, uh, and then we have a series of, of uh, presenters. Some here in our room here in Toronto, where we are at the uh, TMU Eaton Lecture Theater, and some from various locations across the globe. And somehow we've managed to make this work. YouTube audience, we know that there are latency issues. There's all sorts of video issues. Uh, there's a really good reason we're on, stuck on one uh, Wi-Fi stream here at, at the Eaton Lecture Theater. All other uh, avenues to ex access the, the internet that we thought we were going to be able to use don't work because we're in basically a steel metal bunk bunker. Anyhow, Alan Hardiman, uh, who's a journalist and an audio engineer himself, well known to people here in Canada, and take the floor. Thank you, thank you, Earl. As Earl said, th this started with a simple question. Uh, CDs tend to be mastered uh, at levels, and I'm not gonna use the absolute terms because that's part of what the presentation from the experts will be tonight. Just remember that dB expresses a ratio. So if you think of a, a, a CD being mastered somewhere around minus eight relative to full scale, and Spotify, um, uh, uh, normalizing their uh, stream somewhere around minus 14. The Apple group of uh, uh, companies normalizing their streams around minus 16. And YouTube and Deezer and the other 145 streaming services that everybody use somewhere between minus 11 and minus 16. And then, of course, we have the broadcasters somewhere below minus 20. And uh, then, of course, you have international requirements, which we'll hear about for projects such as the Olympics. So this whole issue of, of loudness and, and, and what's expected in the various uh, delivery chains um, is, is at the root of my question. If I'm making a CD, I need it to compete with other CDs in the listener's collection, so I'm going to try to go around minus 8, minus 10 if it's a pop record. Uh, however, I know that that's going to sound very wimpy on Spotify when they reduce it to, to the average uh, loudness normalization to minus 14. Some of the dynamics that I might have put in it aren't there because I was working with a more restricted dynamic range. So the question is, do, should one mas prepare masters differently for physical media such as CDs and for streaming? and or broadcast, and that's the general question, and I hope that that sets the context for what will follow. Thank you. I'm just gonna wander up here like I belong. Um, I need my PowerPoint up first. There we go. This is me. So I'm uh, Gilbert Solodra. Um, I'm the CEO of Camden Labs. Um, I was deeply involved in the development of the loudness meter that, gets, that measures LUFs. So 
What I want to do is not going to talk like a power user. There's other people here that have used it far more than I have, but um, I'm going to give you a perspective, a historical perspective on how the loudness meter uh, was developed way, way, way back when. So you have to dial back to about uh, the year 2000, and the so-called loudness wars were in full force. Um, and the loudness wars manifested themselves in very different ways across uh, different fields. So uh, in music, you had CDs, uh, you know, CDs and, and vinyl and whatnot, and uh, obviously things were being mastered or recorded differently, in, and uh, that effect, you know, that was part of the loudness wars, but it also was in broadcast and cinema as well, and TV and for broadcast, both TV and radio. And fundamentally, the biggest problem was that the loudness wars were destroying good audio. Audio was just taking a beating because everybody's trying to be as loud as they possibly could. And it was seen by uh, many that the only solution was to come up with some kind of loudness standardization that could be used. Uh, so the first step was we would need to have some kind of uh, standardized loudness meter that everybody could accept and use. So um, the ITUR, which is a standards body, uh, formed a group, a special rapporteurs group, so SRG3, and SRG3 set out to establish an international standard for a loudness meter. And we, the idea was let's start with a mono loudness meter and then build from there. And uh, at the time, I was working for the CRC in Ottawa, which is Communications Research Center, a government uh, lab, and I was the head of the audio perception lab at the time. And uh, the ITU asked me to oversee all of the subjective and objective uh, tests for this loudness meter. So if you're going to try to identify a suitable loudness meter, you actually first need a suitable subjective database that you can then use to evaluate the performance of candidate uh, loudness meters. So we needed uh, a subjective database. And to do that, to get that, we conducted formal subjective tests, and those were, determined, those were done to determine the perceived loudness of a broad range of different snippets, different sequences uh, from different types of typical program material. And then we'd have all these different audio sequences that were used in the subjective database, and we would process them through all of the candidate loudness meters that we would have, and we would use that to evaluate the performance of the different uh, candidate meters. So uh, in a first phase of the study, uh, we developed a subjective test method that was based on sub, uh, loudness matching technique. And again, these were first started off with uh, mono sequences and then moved on to stereo and multi-channel. Oh, there's my cursor. So we have a listener in a room sitting in front of a single loudspeaker, and there was a reference sequence, and that was about a 25-second long clip of a female uh, talker. And the way the subjective matching works is you have the reference signal, and the listener can switch between the reference signal and a test signal, and they adjust. They go back and forth at will as much as they want, and they adjust a volume control until the test item sounds to, has the same perceived loudness as the reference signal, and then the computer captures what was the, the levels offset that was required to balance the two, and you do this for many, many, many different audio sequences. And we had many different subjects. So for the first round of tests, we had 96 uh, test sequences, that they were all mono, as I said, and they came from actual broadcasts from all around the world. And the sequences included speech, music, ads, which are commercials, and sound effects. Uh, we had a total of 97 subjects in five different labs around the world, and when I analyzed the data, there was an inter-lab correlation of 0.98, which is really high. It means everybody was doing the same thing. People were perceiving things uh, the same. So very good result. Um, so in parallel to that, this ITU group, the SRG3, um, put out a call to, for loudness meters, so inviting different manufacturers or research centers to submit uh, objective loudness meters. Uh, ultimately, there were 10 loudness meters that were submitted by seven different proponents, so different manufacturers and, as I said, broadcast uh, centers, et cetera. Um, and many of these meters included very advanced psychoacoustic models, uh, so sometimes the proponents themselves would develop the advanced psychoacoustic model, and sometimes their psychoacoustic model for loudness would be based on well-known uh, models such as, you may have heard of Zwicker's loudness, or uh, Moore's loudness, so those two were included among the 10. 
And so then all of the audio sequences were processed through each of these meters, and the readings from the loudness meters were then compared against the results from the subjective database. Pretty straightforward stuff. Um, so at the time, here I was developing this uh, subjective database and really evaluating other people's meters, and um, I wanted to publish an AES paper, so <laughs> I'm doing all this work, I wanna get a paper out of the deal. Um, so I contributed two additional meters. And my thinking was, one of these advanced models, these 10 advanced models is gonna win. Uh, there, there's gonna be patents all around that, that advanced model. Some company's gonna charge a lot of money. There's gonna be money to be made. Uh, but there might be situations where just a simple loudness meter might be close enough. It's, you know, it may not give you the, the precise result that these advanced meters would, but maybe this would be close enough. So I, that was my thinking of creating these simple meters. So one was a straight up RMS. Uh, it doesn't get any easier than that. And the other one was a weighted RMS, and the weighting is called RLB for revised low frequency B curve. And it, it's very simple. You have your input signal X, it goes through a filter which provides a weighting, so like the RLB, and that gives you the filtered output, and then you sum up the energy and you divide by the length of time, that the, the duration of the sequence. So for those who want, for John, there you go, there's a mathy version. <laughs> Um, so, fast forwarding a bit, we, we had the subjective database, all the meters were submitted, I processed all the data, uh, all the sequences through the meters, and we had a two-day uh, meeting in Montreal by the ITU, and the, the goal was to review the results and to select a loudness meter. So on day one, uh, and this was an important thing, nobody knew the identity of the meters. So even I didn't know the identity of the meters. They were just called meter A, B, C, D, E, F. And so it was entirely blind. And so you had proponents from various companies and they had to vote on what they thought was the best meter based on the data and they might be voting for the competition or not. So that was the most fair way to do it. Um, now on day one, we spent a lot of time debating. Um, I didn't want to, anybody to look at any data until we had decided on metrics. How are we gonna choose a winner? Let's have objective, predefined ways. We're gonna say, this is the winner if. And then we'll start looking at the data, but let's de define the metrics. So we, we agreed on nine different performance metrics. And so based on these metrics, everybody went away that evening, had dinner and drinks, and I went back to the hotel room and wrote MATLAB scripts to uh, build, uh, create these metrics and analyze the data based on these metrics for the, for the next day. So on day two, we all got back together again. I had all these plots for the different meters, handed envelopes to each of the uh, people in the room with all the data um, analyzed, but everything was still blind. It was just meter A, B, C, D, and again, even I didn't know what meter was which. So everybody's looking at, you know, huddled in their different groups, and they're looking at these graphs, and they're trying to infer what might be their meter so they can vote for their meter or whatever. I mean, let's admit what they were really doing, come on. Um, no, we, they were looking at the data and assessing it with the matrix. So while everybody was doing that, I'd already stared at the, the graphs all night. So I thought, hey, I wonder how my two little meters are working, because my benchmark meters, that might be interesting. And as I looked at the data, I said to the chair of the meeting, who's uh, Craig Todd, who is CTO of Dolby, we have to stop the meeting. And Craig goes, are you crazy? And I said, trust me, whoops. It's not you. Oh, it's not me, it's you. Something like that. Anyway, so we did stop the meeting and I pulled Craig aside and I said, I gotta talk to you for a minute. The problem is my simple meter outperformed everyone else. So um, if you look at what this data is, each dot here is one of the 96 sequences. This is the, what the subjects, the actual you know, human beings, thought that the relative level should be, the relative loudness for each of these sequences. And this is what my simple meter uh, found that the, the loudness should be. So it was predicting for all nine of the di different metrics we had, um, that we had evaluated, it was first place in all nine. Uh, so as you can imagine, there was some vivid conversation in the room and, uh, and ultimately everybody agreed to adopt the uh, RLB meter as the international standard. And on the spot, I decided to make it open source and royalty free. And I think that went a long way well, that ended up costing me a ton of money, I found out. Uh, but I thought it was, at the time, it was a big impetus for it to be adopted and used worldwide, right? 
Oh, thank you. I'll pass the hat around later. For, uh, so the, uh, remember this was a mono, oh, I'm gone again. There I am. So remember this, is a, this, this was a mono version of a meter, so I extended it to multi, uh, stereo and multi-channel. And so we needed to expand the subjective database. And so we ran another two rounds of subjective tests with uh, mono, dual mono, stereo, and multi-channel uh, sequences. And so we had a total of, at that point, of 336 different sequences that, in our subjective database. And this is how the meter performed uh, for all of those combined. So the different colors are from the different data sets. Uh, so again, the performance is very good under all these conditions. Um, if you remember the little diagram I had in the equation, you took an input signal and then you process it through a filter, which was the weighting. This is the weighting. Uh, it's a, actually two different filters. Both of them are very simple. They're just second order. So simple biquad if you're doing DSP work. This first one is the RLB weighting. This was actually based on some work I had done completely unrelated as part of my PhD thesis. I developed a perceptual model and uh, this is how I think the ear works. And it does, apparently. And then there's a shelving here that you can see in the, in the higher frequencies. And that's based on um, diffraction and, and whatnot, a buildup of sound around the ear. So you can see that um, what these curves are is um, the response for sounds coming from different angles around a solid sphere. So you see this shelving that happens. Well, that's, that's related to the shelving that you see here. So that's where it comes from. Um, so the final outcome was that the, L the RLB uh, loudness meter was adopted by the ITU as recommendation BS 1770. And then it was extended to allow for uh, short-term uh, loudness measurements. Uh, ultimately was adopted in the US as part of the CALM Act and um, later adopted by the EBU, which is well known as R128. And it's used extensively around the world now for almost two decades and to help try to mitigate the loudness war, which is where it first got started. And as far as I can understand, with good success, but maybe we'll find out differently from our frontline users. And uh, at one point, it was proclaimed that the loudness war had ended from, from around. So uh, there's quite a few articles that said the meter uh, ended the loudness war. So that's kind of nice. And I received a technical and engineering Emmy for my work, which is even nicer. And uh, so the concluding remarks are is that apparently standardization can work sometimes. So thank you for your time and on to the next. <laughs> Who's next? Okay. Questions are later, apparently. Thank you, Gil. Um, as we know, the Calm Act uh, commercial audio loudness mitigation was passed in 2011. I believe it became law in 2012. Is that correct? And Canada followed suit, I think, in September 2012. Of course, so much uh, media is interchangeable. Uh, well, not really. Uh, the CRTC would. Not agree. Ron Searles is a senior audio post-production engineer at CBC who was involved in the ground floor uh, with the uh, loudness uh, project at the corporation. Uh, Ron also has his own uh, production company, Red Maple, uh, where he uh, produces um, uh, chamber music, classical music, primarily. primarily. And I'd like to invite Ron up to the uh, lectern to uh, fill you in on what's going on at the Mother Corp. please. So my take on all of this is much more from a user's perspective. Um, at CBC, I was uh, in on the uh, ground floor of the implementation of digital broadcast and uh, 5.1 audio and all of the loudness stuff that came along with that. Just give me one moment and I'm going to sign in here. Oh, 
Okay. If uh, you could show my screen there. So how many lofts are enough? That was the question um, <clears throat> that went out to all of our members. And um, why should you care? Well, uh, I think this is best summed up uh, in my next slide here. I think it's my next slide. Um, and this is in very plain, simple language, because this is from engineers to the CRTC and from the CRTC to, to producers, uh, that audio signals accompanying digital television are characterized by a lower noise floor. This was as we were changing to, to digital. Uh, and a much wider dynamic range uh, as compared to analog television. Effectively, used, these properties can uh, involve audio quality at a higher level of listener, listener enjoyment. So the whole idea of going to digital was that quality would be better, people would enjoy their, their broadcasts more. And um, it's, uh, what, what was happening with this increased dynamic range is that whether it's uh, intentional or, or, or a compete, perceived competitive advantage, uh, people were still trying to get very loud signals out through this digital technology. And the, and the problem with digital technology, apart from its possibilities of sounding great and no noise and no generation loss and all that sort of stuff, is that we went from a, a signal to noise ratio in analog of, you know, averaging probably around 50 to maybe 70 dB with Dolby noise reduction. And all of a sudden, we have broadcast signals that are now at 16-bit, you know, 90-some-odd dB, at 24-bit, up to 144 dB in theory. So it's a huge difference in dynamic range. And what we were finding was that if you switched from one channel to the next, or if you had stuff coming in from one program to the next, the change in level uh, would be enough to either make you jump out of your seat or reach for, for the volume control to turn it up and down. And there was an interesting study done by, uh, I think, probably partly by you guys, uh, also by Discovery Network in the States. Um, and uh, they found that if you were listening to a program and the level suddenly dipped by uh, as much as 7 dB, you might reach for your volume control. But if it peaked by as little as four or five dB, you'd either reach for the volume control, switch the channel, or turn your TV set off. And this is actual data with multiple tests that, that came to this. So um, that, was a, that was a general problem that people were facing when watching digital broadcasting. Uh, but it came to a head when all of the advertising companies and uh, ad producers were trying to pump the level to the absolute maximum level, and that would be inserted into a program that was at a much more reasonable, you know, sort of TV mixing or film mixing level, uh, considerably lower. And it could be a difference of, you know, 10, 12, 15 dB sometimes. Uh, so in the United States, they first dealt with this uh, with the COM Act, as, uh, as we heard about. Uh, earlier, and Canada was very quick to follow suit. So this, from the CRTC, is dealing primarily with advertising loudness, but also with the station, the station to station, and program to program loudness. So we decided to uh, go with a standard across the board of minus 24 LKFS. LKFS is a is the weighted uh, loudness spec. Um, not to be confused with, with uh, the old-fashioned meters of you know, zero VU and that sort of stuff, and Julie's going to talk about that uh, a little bit later, uh, and a ma maximum true peak of minus two. Um, and does everybody know what true peak refers to? So it's the intersample peaks that may be higher than DBFS, uh, and we have ways of metering that now, and, and so these are uh, how the standards work. Uh, now, if you hit this, all of our broadcast chains, and Julie will get into how the CBC broadcast chain is set up, and Michael Noonan will probably talk about CTV's broadcast chain, but the idea with the broadcast chains is when they're properly set up and you hit that target integrated loudness, nothing changes on your mix. That's the ideal thing. 
uh, it will just go through the broadcast chain. There won't be any dynamic range control. There won't be any limiting. Uh, the mix that you did in the studio is the mix that people will hear on their TV set. Uh, so it should pass unchanged, but if you make your mix too hot, thinking, oh, I want my mix to be hotter because it's a hot music show and it's going to sound great, or if you have a scene that's way too low because you want it to be like, you know, it's a you know, sultry bedroom scene or something like that, it can be hit by dynamic range control at the user end and also at the television end, uh, at, at the broadcast end. So this is uh, the standard uh, dynamic range curve used in uh, the Dolby receiver. And the kind of curve that it has is determined by the metadata sent out by the broadcaster, but the dynamic range control is actually done in your set-top box or in your home receiver. So you can see in this center area uh, here, uh, if you hit that area there, you're going to have a linear signal transfer. There's no, no compression, no expansion, uh, or, or you know, no um, boosting of the um, uh, lower signals. Uh, but if you get beyond that range, uh, you'll hear dramatic differences to the dynamics in your mix, and, and it won't sound anything like the original mix. Uh, now, the Dolby dynamic range control is actually pretty good. Uh, but it's not something that you have any control over, and depending on what dynamic range uh, curve the broadcaster has chosen, it could be much more aggressive than some other broadcasters. So again, if you want to avoid changes to the dynamics of your mix, uh, you want to hit your minus 24 uh, integrated loudness. Now, uh, in addition to that, because uh, broadcasters were so terrified uh, after the law was passed and they had to hit that target of minus 24 uh, regardless of what program came through, a lot of broadcasters slapped on the output of their transmitter or uh, on the output of their signal chain um, additional level control that pulled up all of the quiet stuff and crushed all of the loud stuff so that you know, you'd have a meter that was basically just sitting in one place the whole time. and. Uh, I can tell you uh, from having spent years mixing the Ron James show, there's nothing more ridiculous than having Ron James tell a joke that's just a little bit funny and a couple of people are clapping in the audience, but because he's stopped talking and everything's quieter, the audience suddenly is at full level and it sounds like an uproarious response to a pretty tame joke. And vice versa, massive audience uh, response to a really funny joke and if it gets passed through that same control, all of a sudden the audience doesn't find it as funny as it should be. Uh, the same thing applies. Um, I remember when we were testing various dynamic range controls at CBC, um, I had a mix from a documentary that I had done where there was uh, dialogue, 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 and then went to a quiet scene and you looked at waves way down below uh, about a 100 foot drop uh, washing up on shore, and they were just gentle little waves. And with certain settings on the uh, dynamic range processor, uh, when the dialogue stopped, all of a sudden it sounded like a tsunami was coming over the top of the cliff. And it was nothing like that in the original mix. So this is the, the difficulty you run into with these dynamic range controls. Um, I think most broadcasters now have a lot of this stuff sorted so that if you are in the target range, and Julie and Michael will talk about this more. If you're in the target range, minus 24, you don't try to push it one side or the other, uh, you'll get a pretty good representation of your mix uh, at the listener's end. Uh, so again, hit your target loudness. Now, if I have time, I'll continue talking about a few other things here. Uh, streaming services. Uh, have kind of come out like the Wild West. They're all over the map in terms of their uh, target levels. Uh, originally, there weren't any target levels, and it was just kind of arbitrary, and you'd have these ridiculous uh, swings and level from one piece of program to the next, and then you'd have ads pumped in by Google that were suddenly like off the charts again. Uh, not a great listening experience. So 
all of these streaming services, and this is just a representative of, of the most uh, well-known ones, have a target loudness. Uh, they watch the metadata, and there is a way when you play back on their devices or with their software that they will normalize, in other words, turn the volume up or turn the volume down, to try and achieve this loudness at the playback end. So you get a more smooth kind of stream from one program to the next. Um, now, if you're mixing for broadcast and it's going to digital streaming, this is a problem we run into at CBC, and it's kind of like herding cats to try and get everybody to follow the standard. Our standard at CBC is minus 24 LKFS, regardless of what you're mixing for. And our broadcast chain takes care of the rest of that. And Julie will talk about that. Um, but uh, if you mix to minus 24 and you know it's going to get pumped up to minus 14 to play on one of the streaming services, because we'll be doing the same mix for broadcast as is going to YouTube or is going to uh, one of the other streaming services, uh, it's going to get crushed by the limiter when it's pumped up. And if you want to have control over that, it's better to do that as you're mixing than just leave it to chance. It's, it's not going to, hopefully it won't distort if it's going through the right processing. But if you can mix to a lower target in terms of your true peak, you'll have a better result on the, on the uh, broadcast when it goes to YouTube, when it goes to um, you know Facebook Live and all of these other things. So um, general rule of thumb is find out if it's in fact not just going to broadcast, but it will also be uh, redistributed through YouTube, through Facebook, through whatever other channels there are. Find out what those target loudness levels are and target peak levels are, and adjust your peak level as you're mixing so that hopefully your one mix won't get destroyed when it goes to other, other places. That's my own personal experience and recommendation. Um, yeah, so when your mix gets scaled up, it won't trigger the peak limiting on whatever device is doing the scaling. Music is a whole different kind of thing, but a lot of the same principles apply. Earl, am I still doing okay for time? Are. All right. Time. You're doing well. I'll. Uh, <laughs> further. Okay. So the thing with music is that you have so many targets. Again, You've got all of these different potential loudness levels for streaming. Uh, in uh, uh, CDs, if you're mixing for a CD, typically most of your competition out there is going to be minus 14 to minus 8 uh, LKFS um, or LUFS. Uh, some even hotter, depending on the genre of music that you're mixing. Classical will probably be quieter, you know, minus 20, minus... 22, something like that, depending on how dynamic the programming is. But uh, you still want to be able to hit uh, through your s streaming service, and um, I think Bob is going to talk about this much more later on. You still want to be able to hit something with your streaming service that makes sense. So if your primary target is to be on Spotify and that you know that your biggest market is there, you might think about a dynamic range that's a little lower than if it's just uh, going to be for, um, you know, Sony Entertainment or, you know, one of these other services. But nobody has the time to do, you know, like 14 different mixes at 14 different levels for distribution with 14 different peak settings and final output settings and all that kind of stuff. So you kind of have to find a, a good average for most uh, music mixes if you're releasing to the public. So software to the rescue. And I'm not making a plug for any particular manufacturer here, but this is one that I have used with um, some success, and I think uh, it, it's worth checking out. New Gen, who have been uh, at the forefront of some of the loudness and metering uh, technology in software form, have a device now called Master Check, you can download it. I think it's under a million dollars. It's more than 30 bucks, so you mo might want to make sure that you've got those contracts signed before you 
loaded into your system. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, what it allows you to do is take the final output of your mastering session, put this on as a final plug-in before you go to your monitors, and you can switch between all of the various uh, settings for uh, Spotify, YouTube, uh, Pandora. There, I think there are probably about 15 or 20 different streaming services in their setup guide, and it mimics the codec, the levels, all the stuff that happens. If it turns it into a 320 MP3 uh, file, it does that. And you get to hear exactly what it's going to sound like uh, when it's streamed. So this is a very handy device. Um, so before I move on to Dolby Atmos, this is my recommendation. Try and find a mix that works well on all of them. Save yourself the effort of just doing, uh, you know, save yourself the effort of doing mix for every single one at every single level with different peak limiting and so on. But do check it on this to make sure that you're not surprised when it's finally streaming on Apple and it sounds completely different on Apple than it does on Spotify. Okay? So, uh, the big buzz lately has been uh, Dolby Atmos. And Dolby being one of the early instigators uh, in uh, loudness metadata, which uh, was originally developed through all of the theaters so that uh, a guy could sit in a mixing theater and know that if he made a door slam at you know, 98 dB from his listening position, somebody sitting the same distance from the screen in the theater is going to hear that door slam at 98 dB. They, that's what the original standard for... Dolby Theatres was designed to achieve. You're mixing absolute levels. What you hear in the control room is the same level you're going to hear in the theater. So their loudness metadata and all of their loudness standards and so on originally started with theaters when they started producing um, you know, uh, Dolby AC3 for home use, for, for uh, broadcast streaming and all that kind of stuff. The loudness metadata was incorporated in that because they understood the importance of having consistent levels from one show to the next, from uh, you know one type of program to the next. Uh, so with their background in that, when they uh, came up with the standards for Dolby Atmos, they knew that they had to be in control of this right from the beginning or it was going to be a disaster. There's nothing worse than trying to fold down, you know, 16 channels of uh, streaming audio, which is basically what an encoded Atmos signal is, and have it suddenly fold down to two channels and blow up the final output because everything combines into a much, much higher level. So uh, the research they did, um, they realized that uh, in order to not have things blow up in the final uh, playback, minus 18 LUFs was the target that they hit as an absolute maximum integrated loudness. And uh, in their binaural settings and in the um, receivers, like your Dolby decoder when you play it back on your <laughs> receiver at home, it has built in a limiter for headphones, for stereo mixes, that kind of stuff, that will kick in if it does happen to go beyond a certain point. But you don't really want to hit that limiter if you can avoid it, because it's something you don't have a lot of control over. Uh, so typically, when you compare Atmos, an Atmos mix to a CD, you're looking at you know maybe as much as 10 dB difference, which is kind of like hitting the dim button on the console. Like anyone is going to hear that amount of difference, and it's not very friendly to your mix. If suddenly you've gone from a CD mix that you did, you know, three years ago, and somebody's done an Atmos mix, and now it's minus 18. Um, so. Uh, When you're mixing in Dolby Atmos, one of the first things you need to tell your client is minus 18 is the target, can't go louder than that, it's going to be quieter until it, get, until it gets streamed and the level is taken care of by the uh, loudness normalization. Uh, so here we are, Atmos versus stereo streaming. These are the targets for Tidal, Spotify, Apple, who all do Dolby Atmos. Uh, and the Atmos streaming is minus 18, so it's 
quieter than all of the other standards. Uh, but at least it's not 10 dB we're talking about now. And then if you go to Apple, I think Apple has probably done one of the better jobs of this. Uh, and I think, again, Bob Katz is probably going to comment on this later. One of the great things that Apple does is not only do they, on their devices, they make the uh, loudness control a default option. You can turn it off. But for most streaming services, you're going to want it on so that you don't get blasted by some material and, and uh, other stuff is too quiet to hear if you're you know, driving in your car. Um, but the other cool thing that Apple does is they have two different metadata streams. If you choose to stream things one song at a time on a playlist, it uses metadata for that song as a single. If you choose to stream an album, it takes the metadata for the album and uh, forgets about the song to song and so that the natural dynamic progression through the course of the album, the quiet songs will be quiet, the loud songs will be loud, and they retain that. And this is one of the great things that, about Apple is that they think about this stuff a lot and do a really good job of it. Um, this is the bane of most mastering engineers uh, when they're given stuff from, I mean, it's also the bread and butter, but when you're given stuff that is already crushed before it even comes into your mixing studio, uh, then um, most mastering engineers will spend some time trying to restore dynamics or do stuff that makes it sound like, like the dynamics have been restored. Uh, and the same thing comes when ads are streamed from indie ad producers, often they're either much too loud or too quiet, they're all over the map. So we try to mitigate all of that stuff. Uh, so that kind of covers from my perspective as a user the various types of streaming loudness and, and uh, CD loudness and so on you're going to run into. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just saying that the same thing that was said by CRTC about television also applies to all of the streaming platforms. If you can hit the target, you kind of need to do that, and that's going to deliver the best re result. And that's why all the science has gone into all of these standards and meters and so on. It is a way of achieving better quality and a better listening experience. Um, and again, to get back to the Discovery Channel research on all of this stuff, when they did their first tests and they were checking levels again, minus seven would have somebody reach for the volume to turn it up, plus five would have them change channel or mute it or turn it off. So let's hope that that doesn't happen. And if you uh, stick with thinking about target loudness when you're mixing, hopefully it'll avoid those problems. And I believe that's all I have to say about that. So thank you very much. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. We're getting closer to an answer. Uh, I'd like to move over now to uh, uh, Bell Media, where Michael Noonan has been involved uh, uh, currently as a, a senior, uh, arch a senior engineering architect engineer with the innovation uh, program. Let me get that correct here. Uh, yes, yeah, senior enterprise architect with Bell Media Network and Technology Services Strategy and Innovation Team. Uh, with thousands of programs under his belt over the past 30 plus years, Michael Noonan probably knows more about what's going under the going on under the hood at Bell Media than anybody else. So, without further ado, Michael, please. Good evening, everybody. So lovely to be back with Toronto AES. Um, when Earl emailed me several weeks ago asking me if I would contribute tonight, I thought, 
loudness. And we still talking about loud, oh shit. Yeah, I guess we are still talking about loudness. Um, congratulations. I mean, I think at some level, at least in broadcast space, I feel like I should be standing under a big banner that says mission accomplished, like George W. Bush on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we're just more than a decade into the loudness era, calm, et cetera, was, was referenced. Um, I always think of the 2012 London Games as sort of the dividing line, sort of before loudness and after loudness, and that's largely about the way that we, we had to deal with it in Bell Media. Um, okay, great, so 10 years on, what have we managed to accomplish? And why do I think some people probably imagine that mission accomplished banner is, um, would be a reasonable ask? Well, the, f the first job in uh, broadcasting is to make the phone stop ringing. <laughs> um, and the phone meaning the audience you know, complaint line, right? Audience relations line. And the, the truth of the matter is we've been um, very successful at that. Um, moving away from level-based management and, and adopting loudness uh, in all of its intention uh, all the way through the ecosystem has indeed functionally erased that whole problem of the commercials are always louder and the phone's ringing off the hook. And I mean, really, if people are gonna to call to complain about the fidelity of experience on one of our channels, it was typically about audio they were complaining about. They weren't calling to complain that the gammas were crushed on discovery <laughs> travel, like, they, or the blacks were slightly too low. Um, but they would call to complain about audio and they didn't tend to call uh, to complain about the quality of that experience per se. It was always about loudness. Commercials are too loud, music's too loud on this, I can't hear that, how come the, burp, 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 burp. And it was either someone calling to complain about their personal experience sitting in their living room, or sometimes worse, it was a producer of a program on our air calling to complain about how their show sounded on our air. Because it surely was not how it sounded in the mix theater when they signed off on the mix. This is back to Ron's point about trying to normalize the experience from creation environment to consumption environment. So, okay, in that regard, this whole loudness thing worked because the phone has kind of stopped ringing. And what did we get for our trouble? Well, at Bell Media, and so that covers all of our brands, in the television space, and I point that out because it's actually kind of part of the story, but at least in the conventional linear broadcasting space, we created a situation where every Wow. Okay. Um, where everybody in the company was listening to the same thing, looking at the same thing, using the same language, and using the same workflow. So that meant that for the first time ever, everybody was looking at the same meter. That had never happened. Not just the same kind of meter informed by the same algorithm or math, thank you very much, by the way, I mean, truly. Um, but like physically the same meter. So why was that a big deal? Well, if any of you have spent any time in the broadcast space, you'll know that it wasn't that many years ago <laughs> where <laughs> you can imagine what the response would have been if I'd gone into my boss's office at any given day and said I wanted him to buy $10,000 meters for every one of our audio mix rooms. I mean, there would have been some bad language used. And I wouldn't have got the $10,000 for one room, much less all of the rooms. I certainly wouldn't have been able to convince someone that on the basis of saying that we're taking a big chunk of our ecosystem, and by that I mean anyone who created content in, no, in non-real time. So we're really talking about editors, right, and post mixers, et cetera. Anyone who's not making live television but is creating content, they have a really simple workflow. It's, it's, it's magical to talk to a video editor now and train them about this stuff because you're essentially telling them, trust your ears. 
Now, in truth, many of them back in the day, 10 years ago, got told, hey, guess what, guys, good news, you can ignore your meter now. Well, but video editors have been ignoring their meters since always, so that was not actually the right way to say it. The, the right way to say it was, don't look at your meter while you're cutting, cut the story, mix it, make sure you're happy with it, then measure it and then scale it to the target and make sure it's still good. And in general, you're never moving more than a few deep, right? And that was the other learned experience that with a consistent monitoring experience across the range of environments that we create content, so from the smallest of little news edit suites all the way up to a big Atmos mix room and everywhere else between, in between, if everybody's listening to the same quality loudspeaker, that was revolutionary and it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for loudness because loudness opened the door to having a conversation about giving people the right tools and then telling them to trust their instincts because the tools would back them up. And that's actually what the story for most content creators when it, you know, um, who are not live television practitioners, that's, how, that's what the story was and still is today. For live, it was a little bit uh, more challenging, of course. But, hey, look, we did do all of that. We don't worry about commercials anymore. We don't even talk about ingesting them separately or differently or pre-processing them or any of the nonsense that we went through for years and years before loudness. Um, so we got rid of all those nasty brick wall limiters. We got rid of drawers full of tech specs for every broadcaster and production company on the planet. And every time we would produce a, 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 a series for Discovery Canada and then we're selling it around the world, I mean, it was a full-time occupation for our distribution folks to make sure that something that was coming off the shelf was going to meet the tech spec from, you know, random foreign broadcaster 432. Whereas now, thanks to A85, thanks to R128, it's absolutely possible to have a mix sitting on the shelf which is legal around the world. And that's, that's essentially a global tech spec for television content. That's, that's amazing. It wasn't really in, sort of the intent, but that's the, the consequence of it. Um, so we got great meters everywhere, we got great tools everywhere, we got, agno we got format agnostic workflows. It no longer mattered whether you were looking at something that was mono or stereo or three channels or 7.1. You could use the same tool and the same workflow and the same approach and get the same result that would allow you to take that piece of content and put it in service with any other random content that had been a appropriately subjected to the same workflow and you got really great consistent results. You didn't get that, you know, sort of loudness going up and down like a toilet seat all night long on every channel we ran. Because um, that's what happened for most of the history of broadcasting. So what's left if the banner is garbage because it's not really mission accomplished? Well, you've said it too. It's, the digi it's digital. It's everything else. It's everything outside the traditional linear broadcast path. And our organization, like most, have been, have been sort of deeply bifurcated by the appearance of the web and digital and OTT and everything, right? There's almost two silos where the linear broadcast world continues to work the way it has and does. And yet there's this almost 100% duplication in many places where the same activities are happening just with different badges on them, different labels, doing the same kinds of job functions but for digital. All right. Okay, so to the extent that we can converge and all broadcasters, all media companies are desperately trying to converge those two um, trunks and get to a point as soon as humanly possible where the only variation is how stuff enters the ecosystem at the top and how and where it leaves at the bottom. But everything in between should be as common as possible. And loudness is one area where it's really tough to be common right now, most especially because if you don't like the loudness on YouTube, who are you going to call to complain about that? With? Who are, you going to call, are you going to call Netflix and complain? Well, first of all, Netflix doesn't have ads just at the moment, at least the way I consume it. Um, I suppose that on an ad-supported service, if the commercials were suddenly too loud, they'd be subjected to the same audience relations haranguing that we used to traditionally get. 
But look, until somebody can hold a non-traditional competitor to a broadcaster to account and say, hey, here's the standards, please use them. Uh, so notwithstanding Bill C-11 and changes to the Broadcasting Act and, and whether or not in this country in future the CRTC ends up having the same sort of teeth with digital platforms um, as it does with linear broadcasting platforms, well then maybe things like those, um, those CRTC policies that were the Canadian equivalent of CALM could sort of play in the way most of us are creating content these days. Um, or rather consuming content. Where am I? Oh, eight minutes, good. Um, what else did we lose? Well, we didn't lose it because of the arrival of the loudness era. It's just coincidental, but it's a really shitty coincidence. We also lost any practical experience in the broadcast ecosystem of dealing with dynamic or agile metadata. Too few organizations had it to begin with. A decade ago, as the loudness era was dawning, most people in the television business thought the word metadata was a dirty word. They also thought it specifically referred to Dolby Digital metadata. Um, and they, they pretended that things like closed captioning and time code weren't metadata. Um, happily, 10 years on, Despite the fact that we've done all this good for broadcast space and we have this faux mission accomplished banner, the truth is we've all been coloring inside of the same lines for a decade. And exclusively because we've forgotten one part of A85, the recommended practices document that says, use NEG 24 LKFS plus or minus two absent prior agreement between parties. The Dolby metadata system still exists. Nobody watches television in this country except by way of the Dolby ecosystem. Dial norm still exists as a metadata parameter that's still being exerted every moment that someone is tuning into one of my channels across the whole, from TSN to Discovery to all of the specialties of the CTV networks, right? You're listening to dial norm express itself. It's just that dial norm has been hard set to neg 24 for the last 11 years, along with the rest of the metadata profile, by the way, because at the same moment we were introducing the loudness era, we were also migrating away from an inconsistently deployed use of something like Dolby E or VANC embedded metadata or pick your poison. And all broadcasters have gone to essentially a, a static, discrete payload system where you're like, right, we're not going to tell you we're doing this, but really what we're telling you is here's the way we're profiling the Dolby metadata on emission. So you just please deliver to fit inside of that box, thanks. And the most important one of those potentially is that dial norm number, which used to mean the loudness of dialogue and now has been a stand in for, well, what's the LKFS number that just came off of that meter? for television purposes anyways. It's different in other sort of genres and, and uh, marketplaces. The point is, the, the dozen years sort of post-calm are also the first dozen years of the television everywhere era. And you know we've spent, as an industry, the last decade plus making it sure that you can watch what you want to watch, where you want to watch, and on which device you want to watch it creating the illusion that there is but one single episode of that third season of Seinfeld. And you can start watching it on this and finish watching it in the bedroom and you've just been watching two pieces of the same thing. Of course, we know that that's nonsense. There's actually 492,000 copies of that episode of Seinfeld and the system you know, makes it you feel like there's only that one episode you were watching. Okay. The point is we handled what you wanted to watch, where you wanted to watch it, when you wanted to watch it, how you wanted to watch it, but we didn't yet have the capability of figuring out whether or not the how in your decision making, meaning on what am I listening to it, for instance, how should that change my experience? And in other words, so can the quality of my experience be informed by the choices I make about the device that I'm going to use to consume this content and in fact how I'm actually listening to headphones, loudspeakers, et cetera, et cetera. The trick to all of that is going to inevitably have to do with metadata 
whether or not it's Dolby metadata or not is largely immaterial. Happily, in the last decade, while the audio community in broadcasting has forgotten about dynamic metadata, um, the rest of the industry has been inundated with metadata. And so now we don't even, we, now it's just presumed that there's truckloads of data sort of moving in parallel with the payload. Everything from captioning, sure, but also things like um, scene and shot based visual metadata. Firstly, to govern things like dynamic range so that you can tune into a program that's being offered in HDR 10 plus, let's say, but you have a standard dynamic range television. The reason why it might look like something and not like garbage is because of metadata. Um, there's a whole raft of it, and especially now with this whole metaverse VR, XR, AR nonsense, um, tracking metadata and whole hosts of other very tightly synchronized data points are now sort of flying about along with that principal video and audio payload. So in the coming years, when we tackle, because we most surely will, um, how to get that mission accomplished banner to equally apply to everything that happens on the digital side of the equation, the answer is almost certainly going to be some kind of metadata because the answer will not be let's master twice because we're trying to undo mastering twice. We're trying to specifically get away from doing it twice, archiving it twice, caring about it twice, storing it twice, et cetera, et cetera. So mission accomplished, everybody. Yeah, you did it. Um, we did it. Now we just have to, you know, do it better and again. And uh, with two minutes and 53 seconds to spare. I'm out. Thank you, Michael. It was entertaining, informative, and wonderful. I um, would like to round out our... Uh, broadcast uh, payload here by going to Montreal to, uh, are we good to go to Montreal? Uh, uh, to, can you hear uh, me? Yes, I can hear you. Julie Gagnon, who is a senior engineer at CBC uh, Radio Canada Broadcast Engineering Services, uh, and uh, Francois Goupy, who is project coordinator at Radio Engineering. So to Montreal, uh, over to you. Okay, uh, sharing my screen, wait a second, slide, range, view, slideshow. Okay, so do you see my screen, everybody? Yes, and do I speak loud enough? Okay, so uh, good, every, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so um, what I wanna talk, uh, I, I wanna share with you tonight, uh, our strategy at uh, CBC Radio Canada um, to achieve loudness control. And I agree with a lot of items that my predecessor uh, presented, except uh, the uh, switching to dynamic uh, internal metadata. Uh, maybe you'll understand along a little bit later. I've also added a few uh, slides that were not in my presentation following what Ron has, has, uh, has said. Uh, so for those people that are less familiar with um, the, the concept of normalization, uh, previously in the past, okay, we were normalizing content using the peak of each program. So imagine that all these figures represent different program with different dynamic. Obviously here the star will have a large dynamic while the circle will have a short dynamic. So most of the broadcasters or companies have always have an alignment mechanism. So if you take the peak normalization uh, mechanism, you see that the center, the center of all of these figures represent the center of gravity of the program. So even if you have aligned the program with the peaks, you still have a difference in the overall loudness between the programs. So this is what uh, the algorithm, like uh, the loudness, the BS1770 algorithm has allowed us. With measuring the, 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 the content average loudness of each of the program, and then after that, realigning each of the program using the same average. So 
a standard is always better than no standard. So in this case, the advantage of working this way is that you have the average content which is similar. Of course, try to imagine that this figure here, the triangle, let's say here at the top, you have a scene with uh, some shooting, which is really loud. And then after that, you go to a commercial that has a, a smaller dynamic. For sure, as we were explaining before, the, the listener will feel the difference. And if that difference is too big, well, of course he will be annoyed. But still, just by normalizing the average content already improves a lot the, 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 the basic principle. Um, so, and then after that, the other element that Ron wanted me to talk a little bit about is that here, that's an old, uh, actually picture from, from uh, Dolby back into the years uh, to 2000, I don't know, like 2005 or maybe later, but so what you have on the left here are your usual, uh, level measurements in DBFS. So DB relative to full scales, and you have different programs and what the algorithm gives you uh, is a single value. If you measure the complete content, it gives you a value. So if we're talking about levels, we will be talking in terms of DBFS. But in order to differentiate the loudness measurement compared to these levels, we will say uh, we will be talking about loudness K-weighted measurement. So that's why it's LKFS. So remember that the loudness measurement is a measurement which is done in the digital domain. So now um, I'll try to share what is my view of uh, our global strategy uh, to control loudness. Um, so, so if I try to summarize the initial question, as I said, a standard is better than no standard. And here at CBC, we have to deal with three types of services. TV, radio, and web services. So what we have decided to do is to, 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 to use a, a unitary average program loudness, whichever the content, whichever the, 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 the service, in order to have a single uh, average loudness at the output of presentation. So, so it is the same for radio, it is the same for, for web and, and, and for radio, and this, in the end, simplifies the life of everybody. So it's easy to say. So by aligning all the content, by decreasing the discrepancies between the programs, then in the end, you have a, a loudness consistency. And then this, the, 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 since you have less jumps, then the, it, the, um, the audience uh, is less, uh, enjoys more the, the service. So it's easy to say, it's not as easy to implement. And if I summarize the strategy, it's quite simple. What we have, we have been involved in all, all, everything that uh, Gilbert was mentioning initially, uh, we were involved in collecting some of the data and in, uh, initially participating in, in the, 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 the discussions and the loudness meters development, the ballistics. So, and um, what we, we did at CBC Radio Canada is take some elements of the various standards that existed. So there's of course the international standard, the algorithm BS 1770, but at one time there was EBU that has some measurements that were interesting. And then obviously we had also the SIMT, the, the, the SIMT recommendation, uh, ATSC, sorry, A-85. So we did a mixture of all what interested us in all these standards, and this is what is our global strategy. So one, one strategy for all services. And it's quite simple, and it's quite logic if you think about it. So I am looking for my mouse. Okay, here. So the best place to correct loudness, it's at, it is at the production stage. If you produce it correctly, you will not have to to modify or to correct it later on. Then after that, you need to, to do some sort of quality control of your content. And if you're consistent with the whole logic, you will correct what's wrong in order to align it, to have it to a, a correct average. So this means that when all the content arrives in presentation, 
if you have to share between services, for example, send content from TV to radio and vice versa or to web, well, all the content is at the same level. And then after that, to, 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 what we need to do is adjust the distribution. And in, in, at this stage, we will see that, so Radio-Canada has decided to change its level on the, the, the web services. But let's start with the internal process. And then after that, I'll quickly um, uh, talk to you about the distribution. I hope I've, I have enough time and then I'm not talking too fast. So what I wanna share with you is that people, we're all saying we need to hit the target minus 24 for the program. So how do we practically manage to get the content to hit that, that overall value? Well, first of all, we need to have the correct tools. And this means that we have to avoid using VU meters and PPM meters because they are level measurements. They are not loudness measurements. And then after that, we need to be con conscious that in any company, in any media company, there's a, some sort of workflow and we need to understand what is the mandate of each of the components of this workflow. And they might not require the same type of metering tools. And what answers that question is the loudness integration times. And often this element is, is avoided. So the first metering measure that we need to do, and it's not actually a, a, a loudness measurement, it's the true peak measurement. So you want to make sure you're not clipping the content. And so the, uh, the BS 1770 gives you what's the, 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 the specs to, in order to achieve true peak, and it's actually by using four times the sampling frequency of the content. Then the next element is loudness. So since the beginning of the, 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 the session tonight, we haven't said what's the approximate time a human being takes to, to, uh, to feel the loudness. And so the average delay is approximately three seconds. So after three seconds, we're able to judge, is it loud, is it soft, and make a decision in that function. So three second integration time may be enough in some cases for, um, uh, for live productions here at CBC, it is the case for for radio production. They have the the peak lim the peak limiting uh, information, and three second integration is is enough. But on television side, maybe for five point one mix, this this integration time is not enough. So let so so. This is standardized, by the way, by the ITU, and it's really, it's the short-term measurement we're referring to, three-second integration. So this, the other measurement that we'll have is a, is a faster, um, uh, is, is, is faster, and it's a 400 millisecond. And so for those of you that still like VU meters and are used to the, 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 the speed of that meter, well, it, Tests were done uh, with a, the meter in the back is actually one which was developed by the CRC. And I, I've never seen, I've seen several meters since then. So since the past 10 years and no one is as good as that one, but unfortunately it's not produced anymore, but it's good for training purposes. But anyway, so so many experts uh, participated in the, the test, radio, TV uh, people, and so, 400 millisecond was considered a good uh, integration time. And this as well has been uh, standardized by the ITU. So then we come to the value that we um, that, that everybody usually refers to when we talk about the long-term uh, loudness measurement. This integration time is important because uh, here I've, I've used a, a, an ITU test files um, uh, and, and by the way, there are, um, there are approximately 20 uh, test files available in order to qualify the meter. So, so it's, it's an easy task to find out if the meter you want to purchase is within specs or not. And what I want to share with you is that the overall duration here is approximately 1 minute and 20 seconds. So let's say we decide that 1 minute and 20 is too long and we just want to integrate during 10 seconds. Uh, well, uh, it's 15 seconds. So you see here, it's obvious that the average loudness of that short duration will not be the same that if you integrate in the overall file. So 
this is why when we say long term, it's not inventing a number, it's the program long term. So if your program is 15 minutes, you need to integrate 15 minutes. If it's 20 minutes, you have to integrate during the full 20 minutes to have the, the value. And so this measurement um, is, is not, oh, okay, I'll come back later. So this value is useful when you're doing live content in order to live and production to, to give you an idea, okay, am I approximately hitting the right target? And most of the time it's used as a monitoring tool when you have finished producing content and checking if it's in the specs or not. And then after that, readjusting. Uh, I just wanna come back. Oh yeah, I, I talk about production here. So these are the tools that are used in production. There's another one that that people might understand um i i i'm a as a spare time i'm a violinist i play classical music and i totally understand the importance and the artistic intent of a full dynamic when we're playing a symphony but people need to be aware what is the target audience so so if you have you're using a cinema dynamic range but actually your content is going to be listened on, I don't know, on the web, on small devices. Well, you have to be conscious that if you switch from one program to another, there might be some loudness jumps. So the loudness range is a value which is not standardized by the ITU. It's actually the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, that uh, that gives um, this informative informative uh, parameter, and it's uh, you can find it in the uh, EBU Tech Tech uh, three three four three if you want to have more information on that. And so that measurement will tell you is it. Uh, uh, t 10 loudness unit, uh, 15 loudest units, and then it can be useful during live production or to measure final uh, completed content. It's, uh, oh, I need to hurry. Um, I want to talk now, if you want to correct the, the file, there's what we call the scaler. A scaler is a device uh, that will be able to, to measure the overall uh, loudness, uh, the average loudness of your content. And, and readjust it. So for example, in this case, your content is at minus 20 and you wanna bring it down to minus 24. So what it will do as a process is reduce the complete, all the audio samples will be reduced by four dBs for, for, for dBFS. So this is a totally, uh, doesn't affect the, the, the dyna dynamic range of the content. It's actually just lower or softer. The only thing you need to be careful is if you have to increase the, 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 the level, well, then you have to make sure you're not clipping the, the content. The other one that is, so we use it here at CBC Radio Canada for the commercials. All the commercials go through that. A lot of content that come from regional content pre pre package will pass through these devices. In some cases, especially in regional size where we have live, live content, uh, we will use what we call levelers. So these are real-time processors and they adjust the content in real time toward the target loudness. So this affects the content dynamic. So, so you need to be aware what's the effect, but you also need to think what is the purpose? What do you want to correct as a level? So this means that when you arrive at presentation, all the content should be at the same average level loudness level and you choose you choose you you should just add a safety net in order to catch catch the the outliers so if it's exceptionally too loud or too soft so if the content is produced correctly it will not be affected but then it might affect the content which is out of specs so i i said i wanted to do i have time because francois it's 50 okay fine okay so what i so now that everything is produced at the correct level. We have to think about what's the distribution purpose. So for television, my colleagues have spoken uh, to you before and, uh, and the, the, we, are you, we are working in a fixed metadata environment and indeed the dial norm is encoded in the encoder. So, so, so 
at CBC Radio Canada, we decided that we not we did not want to be tied up with Dolby E that would that were like we, where we had some fees in order to to buy each of the equipment, and that's the decision we took to go in an open uh, free standard. So that's pretty straightforward. Forward, so you enter the dial norm in the encoder, and then at the end the content is adjusted. Now I want to talk to you a little bit more about the radio. Uh, the uh, the radio. There's a particularity in radio, is that the content needs to be modulated, FM modulated to be transmitted uh, on air, and there's a processor that does that. And so that processor is the device that will squeeze, modify the content. And often when we are talking about radio channels, we're talking about the color of the sound, the color of the station. Okay, that's louder, that's softer, uh, ha has more dynamic or not. And so it's that device that does that exercise. And this, uh, then after that, the exciter modulates the signal toward a central frequency and we deviate the signal. But what we need to do is to, we don't want to be the loudest, but we don't want to be the softest. So, so we need to find the specific parameters in that, that processor in order to get that optimal, um, um, that optimal deviation, which will resort, uh, result in some sort of, of loudness in order to, to, to be the, uh, the average loudness. So this equipment here, all the parameters that this uh, that are, are, are configured, uh, assuming that the in, in, the incoming signal is at minus 24 LKFS. So you can imagine that if your content is coming in at minus 30 or at minus uh, my minus 10, of course the the processor will will do its job, but it will not be as good as it as it could be if it was at the correct input level. So that's why we insist on mixing even the radio at minus 24 LKFS. And last, the last element is the web distribution. So uh, 10 years ago, we had decided that both radio and TV would be at minus 24 LKFS on the web. And we did have some complaints that often for the podcast, the audio podcast, the audio level was too soft with the, with, because of the device that didn't have enough, a, a, enough power or were not. So, and, and we, we, we saw what the others were doing. And in Europe, there's a, the AES standard, web distribution standard, which has increased the level at minus 16. So we decided to follow that regulation. Of course, we're on the web. It's, there's no standard on it, but at one point we need to decide. We cannot just throw anything there. So, so the decision we took at CBC here would be that video and audio would be at minus 24. There are more chances that people switch between, for example, cable and web compared to only audio content where people will usually just listen at a podcast or so. So now I'm sending the... I'm giving the the mic to uh, to Francois. Hi, thank you, Julie. Uh, so, um, just to present myself, so I you know I'm a musician that became an audio engineer, you know, recording classical concerts mostly, on a few CDs, uh, and I work for radio. So I'm going to talk about radio and loudness and how it relates uh, together. Julie did a really good job about explaining the standard, but you know, how it actually works for us on the radio. Uh, for a long, long time, we actually never cared about loudness. Uh, we knew that it was something that existed for TV people and we were very happy to stay with our peak meters and PPMs, right? Uh, because that's what we've been reading since many years with our analog desks. And then at some point it was decided that radio and TV would have the same standard, which makes a lot of sense, especially in a company like uh, CBC Radio Canada, because we're exchanging a lot of content, uh, you know, news, especially between TV and radio. And uh, before that, we actually needed to, you know, have processors that made sure that the levels were pretty much the same on both platforms. So when loudness came to radio, it was mostly a matter of having a unified level throughout the whole company, right? Uh, so they brought us, you know, the, these rules. We actually don't follow the standard quite closely on the radio side, meaning that we don't have loudness meters in all studios. 
in the new ones, in the newer ones, uh, we do, but need the old ones, they're still relying on PPMs and VOs, and that's fine. Uh, when people are sending content to us, well, we ask that they stick to minus 24 uh, and they limit their peaks at minus 10. The reason we limit peaks at minus 10 on the radio size uh, and they don't on TV is because we're, you know, our delivery medium is mostly aimed at people listening in pretty bad environments, right? Uh, you know, in cars, kitchens, uh, stuff like that, uh, on the bus maybe. So uh, we're trying to reduce a bit the, the range uh, of the content. Otherwise, the processors won't be able to handle it uh, properly. Uh, so since Julie mentioned the processors, I'm going to talk about that uh, especially. Uh, so imagine like all content now is produced at minus 24, which is a really great news for people like me adjusting the processors, because it means that we have a pretty constant level hitting the equipment. Uh, before that, uh, what we had to do is have AGCs that would ride the level to make sure that we were attacking the rest of the chain at a consistent level. Uh, it works pretty good with, you know, pop music and stuff like that. But if you imagine the Ravel's Bolero, well, that meant that the snare drum at the very beginning was as loud as the very end of the piece, which is not what you want to have. But uh, if you're dealing with very different levels coming into processors, you really don't have a choice. So now that the levels are consistent, and that's the important point here, you know, it has to be consistent, then we can relax the processing. The thing is that, uh, you know, with FM radio, it's an analog system, uh, like, you know, the old uh, standard television uh, had. Uh, loudness does not exist, right? So it, the signal to noise ratio is not that good. Uh, we, can't, we can't have the same dynamic range they have on TV. Uh, so we still have to squash this level uh, pretty hard to make it you know, work. And there's a loudness word that's still going on amongst uh, private stations. And we're, you know, we're part of it, uh, CBC, because people are moving around stations on the dial when they, they drive their cars. We get the request that CBC should sound um, as almost as loud as the other stations, which doesn't give us a choice but to, you know, uh, and squish the signal quite a lot, which means that regardless of what you send it, so if some people in the room are, you know, mixing songs, CDs, and stuff like that, well, regardless of what you do, pretty much, uh, there's going to be tons of processing afterwards for FM radio, and the processors will actually take care of doing EQ so that the sound signature will be consistent throughout the day. Uh, so that's how it works for radio. Uh, it's all within those boxes, you know, a lot of companies makes them. And uh, imagine, you know, if you're doing mastering for an album, well, the way we have to adjust those processors is basically doing mastering for works that we've never heard or yet, right? Uh, and the mastering is pretty fixed throughout the day. You know, we can do a bit of scheduling, uh, meaning that, you know, during the day, uh, we aim for a louder sound because we're, you know, it's, especially on the French network, uh, it's DJ uh, shows that we have. And in the evening, uh, when it gets to jazz and classical music, then the processor will, switch, uh, will swap profile so there's, that there's less uh, processing, uh, which means that we're a bit less loud when you compare uh, our signal to other private stations. But then it doesn't matter as much because listeners that are looking for jazz and classical music probably won't be switching to a pop station uh, right away. Uh, you know, so that gives us a chance to give more headroom to the signal. So, uh, you know, uh, for radio, loudness still doesn't exist. Uh, I wish uh, it did because then we would actually have a much better signal and much cleaner signal, especially for classical music. Uh, but for now, it's we're still in the analog world, uh, and you know, except for HD radio, which I'm gonna keep uh, aside for now. But yeah, uh, so that that's that's the current state of of things uh, for uh, FM radio. So when you're you're doing you know mixing music and stuff like that, uh, actually don't think too much about it. 
do as you always did. And that's actually what we had to tell our operators. You know, uh, we, we, we have a lot of engineers, you know, doing music for radio at, uh, at our station. And they're used to do their mastering close to zero dBFS, you know, their, their thresholds on their equipment. They're used to a specific levels, right? So when you tell them to mix at minus 24, all of a sudden it's like, well, what am I gonna do? My thresholds are all different. Uh, my equipment is maybe behaving differently. So in those cases, we just tell them, well, mix the way you always did, right? And just scale your content afterwards so that it fits our standard uh, in, inside the building. So that, that was just my little contribution uh, to talk about radio, but I'm gonna add off to whoever's next actually, <laughs> sorry. Thanks very much um, for that uh, clarification of what's going on at Redzio Canada. I just wanted to do a little clarification of some uh, alphabetical references you might have been hearing. Uh, VU meters from the old days, of volume units. My understanding is that in the current uh, parlance, volume refers to a three-dimensional capacity such as bushels, pecks, pints, quarts, liters. We should not use volume in relation to loudness, which, as Julie and some others have explained, is a psychoacoustic phenomenon uh, relating to uh, the appreciation of uh, intensity over time. Um, LUFS, loudness units relative to full scale. We all know what full scale is, is when all the digits are ones in the digital word, and uh, the little red light goes on. The K, you might hear LKFS, a scale uh, loudness uh, K-weighted, similar if not uh, identical to LUFS. The K uh, is represented in our next presenter, Bob Katz, with over half a century of contributions to the audio industry. Oh, wow, uh, LKFS was not named after me. Keep, the, K, the K scale, I understand, Bob, came from cats, did it not? Well, yeah, but not LKFS, that's no. the K waiting. Please. Just the K waiting, yes. Gil Gilbert would, would freak out in the audience. Well, you're there. wrecking my segue here, Bob. <laughs> I'm sorry. And segue, of course, being an important part of mastering, which Bob knows all about, how you transition from one cut to another on an album, and I think that has to do partly with uh, what you're going to uh, enlighten us with next. Bob Katz, please. Thank you. Uh, don't go away. Um, gosh, is that Earl or Alan? I get confused. I'm sorry. Earl, or um, can you stand up there and let me know the reactions from the audience? Because sometimes I'm going to ask for either hand raise, uh, everybody understand, little things like that, and just speak up and say, hey, the audience. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, well, let me share my screen. Uh, everybody did wonderful. We're going to talk about music now. Uh, it's been radio and TV, but um, the standard, or I should say the recommendation, where is it here? Wait, Microsoft Word? No, it's there. There it is. Got it. Okay. And share. And then uh, put this up. So does everybody see the title up there? The fallacy, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, but the um, recommendation TD1008, which I participated in, um, was created by a, um, a small group of eight of us that worked for a year and uh, very much covers uh, TV, radio, speech, and music. So uh, even though my talk is music centric today, I wanna make it clear that TD1008 covers uh, both. But right now let's talk about music mastering and see how it all fits in. And uh, also about a fallacy, which I uh, believe is kind of misunderstood uh, about uh, album mastering. So let's see, how do I approach music mastering? I need to hide the, I need to hide, can't get to it. All right. Um, I try to set my monitor gain the same for all the albums in a similar genre. That makes sense. And folks, this yields a remarkable consistency. 
I begin mastering, and here's the key, using the loudest song and the loudest passage of an album. And I adjust that forte or fortissimo to a good loudness without it sounding squashed to not over compress. I master all the album songs relative to that loud song in that context. So the ballads are typically softer and the rockers are typically louder. Still, even though the ballads are softer, because I'm using my ears, the listener doesn't have to touch their volume control because everything sounds right to them. But here's a controversial idea. I feel that the listener typically adjusts their volume control to the loud passages, not to the mythical average or integrated loudness of the album or even the song. But let me explain, because this is controversial. It's We're talking here about the loud passages. If the It is a fact, of course, if the first song is a soft, has a soft beginning and builds to a climax, the listener needs to adjust their volume control at the beginning of the song and the climax should follow in proportion. That is true. But think of a motion picture. In the motion picture, dialogue is the anchor, but in music, the loudest passage is the mastering engineer's anchor. Now, I don't think this has been spoken about very much, but I believe that the loudest passage is the anchor. And let's see if we can prove how that works out. Uh, here's a thought experiment. Uh, we're gonna master a two album set produced by the same artist, okay? In this two album set, all the music was produced in the same studio by the same artist. Album number one and album number two were mastered, perhaps by a different mastering engine, by a mastering engineer on the same day, the same mastering day. So they should be pretty consistent. The monitor gain was held constant for mastering both albums. All the songs on the two albums were mastered in the same context. Ballads sound right and the rockers sound right. So both albums work together as designed. The listener doesn't have to move their volume control. Everybody follows so far? Hands in the audience? Yes, hands okay. up. All right. Now, here's this thought experiment. And stick with me for a moment. Album number one has nine rockers and one ballad. I know it's strange, but let's... Eh, I, I said this was a thought experiment, but it is based on real life. And album number two has one rocker and nine ballads. But remember, these two albums were mastered in context, and the listener doesn't have to move their volume control. But the integrated loudness, as you can guess, of album number one measures much higher than that of album number two. Would anybody deny that? Doesn't it make sense? Nine rockers and one ballad measures louder than one rocker and nine ballads. What does that mean? What is the consequence of this little discovery? Consequence is, first of all, both albums work together as designed. The listener doesn't have to move their volume control. Therefore, and here's the conclusion, using integrated loudness for music albums is deceiving. Okay, audience, any groans out there? Dead silence. Right? Sounds logical? Raise your hands. Anybody yes. deny the logic of this? Okay, that means you agree or you... If everybody in the audience agrees with this precept that integrated loudness for music albums must be deceiving, raise your hands. All right, all right, some people agree. Now, folks, a funny thing happens when you normalize to the loudest song instead of the integrated loudness of the entire album. And here's what happens. The listener can shuffle play the album songs and everything still feels right, even though the ballads have a lower integrated loudness. 
they can shuffle play different albums, even different genres together, if each album has been normalized to the loudest song and all the rest of the song's gains are matched to the gain of the loudest song. In other words, you don't turn up any of the songs, you set it to the gain that was adjusted for the loudest song. Okay, everybody follow that. The loudest song being the standard. It is also true that the more dynamic the music, the more important it is to normalize to the loudest passage. If it's really squash material, it hardly matters whether you use integrated loudness or loudest song. But if it's a dynamic album, it's really important to normalize to the loudest passage. And here is another concept that I think people haven't thought about too much. Track by track normalization is upward compression by linear amplification. Because when you bring up the soft songs, things song sound wrong. If I took a Frank Sinatra band, big band album, which has quiet ballads and loud uh, full band songs, and I turn up the everything to the same target, it's going to sound wrong, which means that any music service which does not use album normalization by the loudest song is compressing the music. It's as good as having a compressor by a volume control, just turning up the gain, which is compression, shall we say, linear amplification, but it is compression. So that's why um, the music people in the committee that I participated in came up with AES recommendation TD1008. Now that's too much for me to read. So let me just read an excerpt from TD1008. Oops, I went backwards. Okay, come on, there we go. So uh, let's just find an excerpt from TD1008. The first excerpt, when operationally feasible, it is strongly recommended to use album normalization, even when playing tracks outside the album context, even shuffle play. So if Spotify is still track normalizing when you mix different albums together, it goes against the recommendation of TD1008. An additional advantage, because the second piece there, an additional advantage of album normalization is that different genres become more compatible and they play at the appropriate loudness. Different music genres often can be seamlessly played together in the same playlist. And why is this true? It's true because regardless of genre, the mastering engineer produces the quiet tracks of all the albums that they master in a similar aesthetic proportion to the loudest track. So if you combine different albums in a playlist, all normalized to the loudest track of each album, the chances of these different genres playing together and feeling right are very high. And that's why I say, well, let's wait, go back, hold on. I, uh, and uh, if you wanna know what the integrated loudness recommendation of AES TD1008 is, it's not, it doesn't use an integrated loudness norm or recommendation for music. It recommends that the loudest song be normalized to minus 14 luffs. It could be lower, but that it be no higher than minus 14 luffs. And what this does is it yields an integrated average loudness for the album of approximately minus 17 to minus, minus 16 to minus 17 luffs. Because if you have the loudest song at minus 14, the average of all the others will be a little lower, the average, the total average. And that's why I say album normalization is almost artificial intelligence. It's really, really smart. Many different genres can be played together. When you line up the loud passages of different albums. And that's why the AES in TD1008 highly recommends to all streaming services to practice album normalization 
all the time, not just for classical music, even when shuffling from different genres, uh, you could take, I, I can tell you that hip hop and rock and pop, each when normalized to the loudest track can be played together pretty well in a playlist. And it's uh, pretty amazing when you hear that work. So I hope that everyone will help participate in uh, uh, pushing and uh, advocating to the streaming services that um, we, uh, that they do album normalization all the time. It's logical when you understand these principles. It seemed illogical to those who are still trying to put the singles and when people shuffle play, they turn off the album norm. If you keep it on all the time, it'll work really well. And that's, um, that's the conclusion of, of my talk. I do have some, when we have our questions, I, I, I took notes from everybody's talks. I have my thoughts about them, but I'm really happy to be here. And I want to also thank Gilbert Saludra for inventing the loudest meter. We wouldn't be all here if it weren't for Gilbert, who I hope is still in the audience. And, and I hope that uh, Gilbert agrees with my principle here about album normalization. That's my talk. Thanks. Oh, we got it. Uh, Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. This is, uh, as usual, a pretty revolutionary uh, thought experiment. <laughs> Uh, we've, been, we've asked everybody to hold their questions up to now, but uh, I think that we still have uh, all of our, uh, or most of our presenters uh, at hand. So uh, we have a microphone in the aisle, and if anyone has a question, please, uh, please ask it. Uh, now I know we had one earlier that we asked the person to hold it. Sorry. Would you like to? Uh... Uh, this one's for Gil. A question for Gil, okay. Or you can come, you can come up here, it's closer. Hi. When you designed your loudness meter, you were basing it, I believe, on a, a modified B curve. Is that what I heard? That's the name. Come on, right beside yeah. me. Well, otherwise it doesn't go to YouTube. Yeah. So the no. question, I guess, is the RLB, was it based on a modified B curve? So you yeah. know the A weighting B and C. Yeah. Um, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so there's a B in there, so I'm led to believe that, yeah. So it, No. So, okay. Um, so years later, I revealed the secret about the naming of RLB. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do it again to you. Um, so uh, RLB is called Revised Low Frequency B Curve. And for years, people came up, engineers came up to me and go, what the heck does that mean? Mm -hmm. When I was accepting my Emmy, I pointed out that actually our RLB was merely the, uh, the initials of my wife. <laughs> At the time. <laughs> So it was one of these things, and I told this story at, at the uh, at the end when anyone received the Emmy, standing up here at the podium, and it was um, it was Canadian summer, and I was working on this paper, and she said, "Quit working on that." I'm at home working on the weekend. And she says, "Let's go golfing or go out or whatever," and I said, "I can't. I got to finish this paper." And she says, "Well, say something nice about me in the paper, <laughs> jokingly," and so while I'm working on this equation, I just put RLB. And then I spent way more time trying to figure out an acronym for RLB. And I came up with revised low frequency B curve. So that's why I say yes and no. Well, that makes sense. OK. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> this sounds planned. You heard it here, folks. Uh, in, uh, it, while we're uh, getting uh, our uh, questions in order, I have one to Bob Katz. Bob, uh, Given that someone's CD changer may have a bunch of discs recorded hot, minus 8, minus 10, and that I'm looking at putting stuff out on the streaming services with the loud passages targeted around minus 14, and then the rest of it, you know, minus 16, minus 17, you know that that's not going to sound great on a CD next to... Uh, next to what's coming out of the, uh, the pressing plant. So what do I do? Do I make a separate louder master for the CD, or do I just do the one that's aimed at minus 14, and then the client listens to the CD and says, this is nowhere near loud enough. What do I do? Do I make two masters or not? I actually prepared an answer for you, and I typed it up. 
if I can find where notes appears. Where's notes? Notes, notes. notes. Right. There, notes? Oh, Mary. I'll just have to read it. Okay, yeah, CDs have no standard. I personally um, master my, most of my music with around minus 14 to minus 16 luffs integrated. And the majority of my enlightened clients are happy with that. But yeah, there's a lot of squashed and distorted stuff being mastered. And yeah, it sounds wimpy after the streamers turn it down. Maybe the creators will learn eventually. Now, for the kind of music that I work with, um, a lot of jazz, a lot of classical, a lot of um, rock, um, I haven't had an issue. But in the pop field, yeah, there's a lot of competition that you might have to produce the CD master differently. But uh, CDs have died. Don't you remember that? <laughs> CDs are no more. Uh, so I, don't, I think that that's kind of an old uh, question at this point for, for you all. Now, uh, just deal with streaming, and since Spotify is uh, very close, let me hit this button to stop sharing the screen. I, don't, I, can't, I can't stop. I've got the share screen uh, thing on the top of my, uh, uh, my picture, and I can't get rid of it. Okay, so um, since Spotify is at minus 14 right now, and um, Tidal, Apple, and Apple are at minus 16, they're close enough, so I don't think you'd have to worry. Um, if you have a pop client and they say, hey, it's not loud enough because they're not listening to what the results are and you spend 10 minutes explaining to them, you know, when it gets to Spotify, it's gonna sound wimpy, it's gonna be turned down. You have to do what the client insists on and, uh, and mess it up. That's, you have to do it. What can I say? Bob, um, the, uh, the, the 2022 figures from the International Federation of the Phonographic Industries that show uh, the uh, music industry worth about 26 billion US uh, shows that 67% of those revenues come from streaming, which is about two thirds or four sixths, and 17.5% uh, come from physical media, which is very close to one sixth. So yes, CDs are declining, but we're still looking at four to one, like one and one quarter, one to four rather, at a ratio. So when CDs do go the way of vinyl, oh, maybe maybe that's coming no, back. Vinyl anyway. actually is the largest proportion right now uh, of physical media. What, what was really interesting, just as a side note, is that downloads are down to 3%. So nobody wants to download stuff onto their own, uh, onto their own uh, storage, which was interesting. But still, you know, CDs still do account for one in four. However, if you look at companies like CD Baby, they'll tell you that uh, two-thirds of the physical CDs that they ship to their clients, are, the shrink rack is never opened. They're autographed. CD Baby just announced that they're no longer going to do physical product. They're no longer going to sell physical product, but they're still going to make it and ship it to you if you want it. Hmm. Uh, yeah, they're not going to stock it, they're not going to warehouse it, and they're not going to sell it. They're basically an aggregator, and they manufacture CDs. Uh, that they'll ship to you, but they won't sell them. So these CDs are sold at merch tables where they're autographed and sold for 20 right. bucks, along with T-shirts, and they are fetish items that people like to have, like those big 12-inch albums when we were kids and they had mandalas on them. We could look at them while we listened to Dark Side of the Moon and all the rest of it. So yes, people still want to fetish the physical media, and uh, occasionally some of them will be played. So that was the genesis of my question. Yeah, well, like I said, if you have to, do it. But it's not my practice. Well, you've, had to, you've, been, you've been asked to, to, to clip masters too, you haven't you? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll. The thing is, I'm. I, knock on wood, cross fingers, whatever. Um, the people who come to me are people who appreciate what it is that I do, and uh, they don't. The ones who don't come to me, are the ones that I lose. But I. They may come to somebody who's going to squash and, and distort it, and. Um, I don't have to hurt my ears while I'm mastering. <laughs> So maybe we have a, a, a restatement of the biblical injunction that, that no one can make two masters. Or something like that. Um, okay, I want to mention, as long, uh, it's 925, I don't want to dominate the, the, the talk here, guys, but um, let's just see one thing. Uh, sometime, I want to talk about Spotify's, um, somebody in the talks, talked about Spotify, if you 
turn it up. Uh, if you bring it, Spotify will turn it up and overload. So, you know, keep it down. Um, I just want to say that in the, sometime in the past year, now you, you may know that Spotify has three uh, loudness uh, targets, uh, the low one, the quiet one, and the medium one, and the loud one. Well, the medium one is what, wrong finger. <laughs> the medium one is what most people um, are doing at, at home when they're playing with. And that is minus, at minus 14 LUFS. And LUFS is the same as LKFS, by the way. So yeah, minus 14 LUFS. So uh, Spotify will not excessively upwardly normalize if you're doing the medium uh, setting. In other words, if upward normalization gain would cause peak limiting, Spotify's medium setting will not exceed that setting. So there will be no peak limiting anymore with Spotify's medium setting. For example, if your material is at minus 16 LUFS with a true peak of minus one dB true peak, Spotify will not touch it, it will be maintained. Uh, and so that's good news. And just for my own clarification, uh, I believe that's also the case with Tidal and with Apple. They will not go right. into limiting to bring the Tidal level. practices all the normalization and uh, that and a very progressive target which matches TD one thousand eight all the time. Apple, oh, that's an, let's clarify one more thing. Somebody mentioned that Apple uh, will have normalization on all the time. What they unfortunately already uh, announced is that Soundcheck is on by default only for new Apple devices. So they still have normalization turned off for um, older devices. So it's going to take some time for normalization to fully take place in the Apple ecosystem. And that, that's most unfortunate. Question. Uh, I, I real oh, the camera is coming around. Um, Regard it's, it's along the same theme here. We were talking about the, the various normalizations. I just want to make sure everybody's aware that YouTube will do downward normalization, but not upward. That is true. So if you, make, if you, so if you submit material that's set up to minus 24 LUFS, which was one of the suggestions here for mastering, your material will actually come out 10 dB cold. And if, if you want to verify how it's actually coming out on any of the YouTube videos, you can right click and look at stats for nerds and it shows you what it's done to the loudness normalization. Yeah. So it is something to be aware of that not everybody is, is going to, so the strategy of mixing to minus 24 and allowing true peaks of minus 10, you think that, that you're doing the right thing. For that particular streaming service, that won't work out. Yeah, so you have to make two masters, yeah. no, one yeah. for YouTube um, and one uh, for broadcast. Just, for, just for to clarify, yeah. in the mixing suite, we would do that. The idea is that as it gets distributed to YouTube, it does get bumped up to their loudness uh, through a scaler right. before it leaves the building. That's, that's the intention. I, I know you guys do, but um, unfortunately, Mike had to leave. I see a lot of CTV content that's sitting at minus 24 out there. But that, that's, it could be an awareness issue. But I do find it kind of puzzling, though, that if we're going to start shooting for minus 14, minus 15 LUFs of what I will call dynamic range, because implicit in a minus 24 uh, LUFs average and a minus 10 true peak, you've moved your dynamic range, your maximum, down to 14. <coughs> I thought one of the, the arguments for ending the loudness war was to allow the quality of uh, the content to improve, and that's forcing at 14. Everybody's got to do some limiting. Like it's you're just not going to get the yeah. full dynamics in. So it seems a little counter um, on that. Yeah, re regarding that, if I can quickly say, uh, TD1008 is looking towards the future of metadata in the same way as um, the gentleman spoke up about uh, a couple of talks back. So. Uh, it, it, they're trying to be future-proof, and ultimately, we're hoping someday that music will pull down, also to a to a uh, target of minus 24. 
Yeah. And, and, and if I can just speak yeah. to, to, you know, the, the hope is that most of the time we can get away with one mix at one level. Yeah. There are uh, certain types of program, um, you know, the sort of bigger full-length documentaries and things that, that demand a, a, a wider dynamic range. Um, I wouldn't advise doing a minus 10 true peak on that kind of content. Right. I would advise processing a secondary mix if you know it's going to go somewhere else. Like I, uh, if, if you want it to be big and beautiful, yeah. you, you make it big and beautiful. I, I remember um, uh, in one of my first uh, discussions with, uh, with the folks at uh, Discovery Channel when I had done a bunch of mixes for a, a really big, beautiful uh, documentary series uh, called... Um, oh, it, was, uh, it was in conjunction with the nature of things. Um, and there were many, many wide dynamic range scenes, and we got our mix rejected by Discovery Channel. We had been mixing in the suite with calibrated monitors. We had decided what levels we wanted to listen at, uh, you know, like a standard... Uh, in those days, this was before everyone had adopted uh, the uh, RP85, uh, uh, you know, monitoring levels and so on. So we <clears throat> calibrated everything to, to around 82 per box, uh, mixed 5.1. Everything sounded fantastic in our suite. Uh, Discovery Channel rejected it, and I remember having very heated arguments with them that, no, we weren't going to limit our stuff and bring up the, the stuff that was down below minus 27 just to make things look good on a meter for them. And then we went through this whole process, which was a big learning curve for me to understand that not everybody's going to be listening in a home theater that is perfectly set up, and, and this is the reason why we have the limited dynamic ranges. But again, yeah, if, it's going to, if you know it's going to go somewhere where it may be listened to with a wider dynamic range and for that kind of appeal, I would definitely do two mixes for that. Absolutely. And as some of you may be aware, it's, again, it's a little aside, the, the Bluetooth audio is going through a, a big revision where we're going to have low energy audio and a much better sound experience. One of the methods or one of the modes of operation is the so-called AuraCast, which is meant to help replace assistive listening services in theaters like this where we normally do induction loops or infrared, et cetera. That whole group has gone through... Um, quite an argument phase two, and I think there's enough of us pushing to normalize at minus 24 also to make sure that we're leaving the headroom in there because the belief is that for hearing impaired people, we would like the full dynamics to arrive at their DSP, and then according to their hearing loss, we will manipulate the, the sound within the hearing aid, and it just seems like a good thing. Now, AuraCast is not targeted just for those with hearing aids. It's going to become the standard for wireless earbuds too, so the good news is, is that it looks like that transport layer is going to hopefully hang in there at minus yeah. 24. On that note, I, I, my understanding is that one of the reasons for the slow downward uh, move from minus 14 to minus 24 is that currently there a lot of uh, device, phones, for example, don't have the amplifiers to deliver. Right. And you know, you're on this, you're on the subway, and you can't crank it up loud enough to get over the the track noise. Right. Uh, Rob, uh, I, we have a questionnaire, and then Rob, could you, could you take the mic, please? And, and uh, we'll take your question, then Rob, we'll get to you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was just going to kind of ask the opinion of the panel on um, kind of how we're seeing a lot of studies of young people, 18 to 25, who are listening or, or who are consuming media with uh, almost entirely with subtitles on and wondering if there's any opinion on how this 10 years of loudness uh, is sort of coming to pass with that generation of people who are consuming it completely differently. Do, do we have an opinion on if there's a relationship there or if that's something outside of that completely? Like, it's, it could be a million things. It's just an interesting I asked that question idea. to Rex Banks, who's a physician at the Canadian Hearing Society, well, audiologist at the Canadian Hearing Society. He said the largest contributor to uh, hearing loss in young people is improved battery life. <laughs> are you talking then about... Um, Dialogue uh, intelligibility, which is uh, an interesting topic even for those of us with normal hearing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because it's, it's, okay. it's about like we're, we're hitting this number, like we've talked about a number of times. We hit this number almost irregardless of the content inside of that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're seeing an entire generation I, of people who have no hearing loss who are basically telling us that they can't understand what's being said 
on, in their sort of film and television programs? I have a few favorite answers to that one. Okay, number one, misuse of the center channel. You find people at home with two speakers and the center speaker is not in use and they forget to turn off the, uh, the menu in their receiver that says that there's no center channel and also the down mix from uh, 5.1 to, to mono doesn't, I don't think it works very well. I, I hate this single, single release format idea. So misuse of the center channel, it should be used a lot more, I think. And when it is, um, dialogue intelligibility goes up. Uh, the second thing is processing. I think that excessive broadcast processing reduces intelligibility. Okay. Anybody else? Just, yeah, because like, like we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing like 60 to 80% of people are insisting on watching everything with subtitles. Like, like not just your, your Chris Nolans and, and things like that. They're watching everything with it. Rob? Yeah, but I'm, I'm just wondering because like we're, we're, we're saying 60 to 80% of people have like a user error problem or a user, you know, like that's a, it's kind of a cop out for technicians to kind of blame a huge quantity of a population. If you're like multitasking, that. you can read a line of dialogue in a split second that takes three or four seconds to deliver it so you can see the dialogue and then go back to the other thing you're doing and then come back totally. to the movie. You know, maybe there's that. I no, I love the opinions. It's totally just an open <laughs> well, question of like, because that statistic blows me away. It's like, because I, I can't stand subtitles, so it's like I'm on the opposite side of that. Mm -hmm. There's a thing too, uh, if you look at French movies, uh, you know, if you compare French movies and American movies, uh, a lot of times in French movies, uh, I'll actually turn on the subtitles, especially when I'm listening in a you know noisy environment. And the reason for that is that the French don't use ADR as much as the Americans do. And now I'm just making an hypothesis, but I think with the improvement of wireless mics and pickup systems and you know clean up technologies for dialogue, it might be because Americans are using less and less ADR. So they're, I mean, it's a good thing because they're using the natural capture of sound, but then that's probably harder to listen to than you know, someone doing ADR in front of a, a fixed microphone. Like reality TV. Uh, we have an okay bedroom system. It's not terrific, but it's reasonably decent and I EQ'd it the best possible. I'd say for both my wife and I, um, maybe 10% of the shows we watch, we turn on the subtitles because of intelligibility issues. Um, and we have a good center channel. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we both have normal hearing. So there may be some issues. Yeah. I'm talking about in, in broadcast, the major networks, uh, the way they come down to us, they're highly compressed stuff. I'm sorry, a lot of processing. And there we, uh, we often turn on the subtitles, but for HBO, uh, Netflix especially, um, stars, you name it, the ones that are not processed, uh, we, uh, we rarely have to turn on the subs. Sometimes. So I'm just gonna jump in here, uh, if you don't mind. Interestingly enough, I had this discussion with my kids at dinner last night, because <laughs> they were saying, they're both adults and they were saying that they have uh, subtitles on constantly. They knew I was coming here to give the talk. Um, I was assuming a lot of it has to do with mixing. The dialogue is just mixed lower. What occurred to me in this discussion though was what has changed in the past. Um, one thing that may have changed is probably, and other people in the room will know much better than me, the majority of content now is mixed or recorded and, and mixed as multi-channel. Right. My kids aren't watching it on a home with a home receiver and a home theater. No, they're, they're watching it on a on a portable device, right? So somewhere in there, that's being down mixed. So some of the down mixers try to do a binaural if you're wearing earbuds. So is that binaural processing actually, you know, causing some issues in terms of of uh, perception? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's just down mixing to regular stereo, well, there is something that's not thought about too much, but it's, it's spatial masking. Yep. And, that's the co and that's the cocktail party effect, right? Is I, I can pick out something over there, but if there's somebody also talking and they're in the same location, that person is, is that noise, the person who I don't want to hear, 
interferes more because they're spatially co-located. Yep. So now for down mixing, uh, when we're down mixing from say 5.1, 7.1 to two, well, the down mixers probably want to re retain energy and level and all that kind of stuff, completely ignoring anything like spatial masking that would happen. Just a thought. You need a yeah. special mix for stereo and mono. And I think broadcasters um, uh, are, tr uh, are in denial about that. They, they want a single 5.1 or at most and let it happen at the receiver and, and intelligibility suffers. Yeah, if I can just add to that, I, um, it used to be the case that the stereo mix was always a separate mix from the 5.1. Uh, CBC uh, English Broadcast only uses one mix. It's the 5.1 feed with the metadata doing the down mix at the set-top box. So we publish in our broadcast standards and, and our you know, delivery standards at CBC exactly what those fold-down parameters are, and you're expected when you deliver your mix to have basically set your balances in stereo, checking in mono, making sure that you still like it as much as you possibly can in 5.1. When I'm working in the studio, my final balances are always set on a pair of, you know, oratones or equivalent, uh, at relatively low level, uh, to make sure that the dialogue is still clear, using those fold down parameters. That's how that works. And then when you bump it up to you know proper playback level for the suite, according to ATSC, RPA eighty five, you know, like in a room like I'm mixing, it would be 70, 76 dB SPL per box. It sounds fantastic in 5.1, but I know it'll still work in stereo. But it, you do have to pay really close attention to those uh, parameters. I wonder how many people follow that approach. Uh, so Everybody that I work with does. I don't know. <laughs> uh, for me, the elephant in the room is the fact that we started out with the idea that we we're going to solve a bunch of problems with loudness and the loudness wars, et cetera. And then... When the slide came up there to show all the different streaming services having completely different standards, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, yeah, I'm an old school guy. I watch a little bit of live sports and, I, uh, and news, and pretty well all my other content is over the top. My kids, it's all over the top, or YouTube. So, so, so really for the current generation, we're back where we were 15 years ago. Is there any discussions at all at a higher level, at a standardization level, where the Amazons and Netflixes and YouTubes of the world are going to get together and do what had happened already with television? Thanks. Netflix has a standard. It's their own. Yeah. Well, I don't know the answer, but Dolby should probably be at the table, because they usually are when there's a standard. It's, uh, Percolation. Uh, my question. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. My question is, is in regards to the K weighting filter that's being used. It aggressively uh, filters low frequencies. Uh, for instance, there's about a 30 dB drop from one kilohertz to 200 hertz. Uh, could that also mask out the low frequency speech, perhaps, which is contributing to speech intelligibility? If, if the filter is that aggressive in the low frequency area. And uh, that, that's one of my questions. My other question would be, are we taking into account the nonlinearity of the human ear with equal loudness contours? I notice that's not been mentioned at all. Uh, it's just a K-weighted filter that we're using in our calculation for loudness. Uh, so the RLB filter, which is the low-pass portion of the, because there's two parts of the filter, right? One was a high-frequency shelf, and then there was a, a low-pass filter. <clears throat> okay. um, it, sorry, high-pass filter, um, and yeah. it's not as aggressive as your. Yeah, uh, as, uh, yeah, the numbers maybe weren't clear on the screen. It's it's, it's yeah. very low uh, frequencies and be below my fundamental of, for speech, so I don't think it would be affecting intelligibility. Uh, but we're not measuring uh, according to the nonlinearity of the human ear, then, using equal loudness contours the way it's done in. Uh, can, I, can I address that? Yeah. Uh, 
the the um, accept practices RPA eighty five uh, does talk uh, a great deal about uh, listening level, uh, and when you uh, set up your monitors in your room, uh, depending on the size of the room, it would be anywhere from uh, about seventy eight dB uh, SPL per speaker uh, down to about seventy two dB SPL. Per Per speaker for a room that's a smaller volume. So for a room this size, you'd probably mix, be mixing at 78 dB per box uh, for television. Uh, and th at that level, you're getting into the linear okay. uh, on the Fletcher Munson curve of uh, the human right. hearing. So, okay. yeah. 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 I'd just like to make a comment on this um, intelligibility mm -hmm. issue related to frequency response. Uh, as a guy who worked in special services, uh, Bell Canada, for 29 years, I supervised a lot of uh, issues that related to the equalization of transmission lines between transmitters and studios, etc. But it was very interesting to me early on in my career to look at the old telephone lines with the H88 loaded pairs who basically had no usable frequency response below about 280 hertz. And it didn't affect intelligibility whatsoever. The most important issues were really much more to the upper harmonics. The sibilants and those consonants, hearing those makes all the difference in the world. And the bottom end, in terms of speech intelligibility, was almost a non-issue. That's probably why we hear these hip-hop records with <laughs> tremendous lyrical content which is very important, crucial to the uh, artistic intent of the song, with a ton of bottom end, but not much masking the voice. Yeah, yeah just as a, as a postscript to that, um, when we're talking about intelligibility, we, we usually say that vowels, you know, vowels tell you that someone is, is talking and consonants tell you what they're saying. <laughs> Question? Yes, thanks. Um, as recently as five to seven years ago, it wasn't unusual for U.S. broadcasters to send content back to distributors saying, sorry, not on our network, you're going to have to do something about the loudness. And so I'm, I'm wondering whether, number one, that's changed now because of the prevalence of automated methods, and number two, if it has changed, has it changed because the methods are better or because people are just more tolerant now of the weird artifacts that they introduce? Thank you. Anyone want to address that question? Uh, maybe I can answer that one. Um, uh, the, 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 the way uh, CBC and uh, Radio Canada are working is, is a little bit different, but uh, basically, as Ron mentioned earlier, we do have some exact acceptance specification for any content which is delivered and it's either rejected or it goes to post to be uh, corrected. Uh, so, so depending on the, 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 the content, um, I, I, any of the commercials, they, these are easy to correct. They can go through scalers, but if it's a wider dynamic, it needs to go through, through, through post and be adjusted manually. So the rejection and thresholds haven't really changed over the over the last no, ten because years. it's you, you will always have people that try not to follow the rule or do yeah. not understand it or do not know how to use the tools or like are really small do not have the equipment to 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 produce. So this does not change, and and so and and we also have the situation where we have to accept in some cases for for the web. We're being told, well, this is the catalog of the movies, so either you accept them or not. So, so, so we have a whole range of of, of situation. So the idea is to always try to have kind of a, a rule and try have to deal as ha, have a, a a process in place and, and try to stick to it. Okay. And not you. spend too much time on exceptions. Is there a question, Doug? Did you have a question, Doug? Doug, come up to the to the mic. Uh, Doug McClement has a question or a point to make. 
Hi, folks. I, I come at this from a little different angle in that I sort of specialize in live events for television, mostly music events, mostly award shows. I've mixed the Juno Awards the last 20 years and the Much Music Awards for 20 years and Grey Cup Halftime for the last 15 years. Those shows go out simultaneously in 5-1 and uh, stereo. The stereo is a fold down of the 5-1 mix that we're doing in the truck. I find that during the sound, I've learned, what Mike was talking about the phone factor. This is a very real thing. For a while, when things were terrestrially being distributed, we, a week after the Junos, you hear, oh, there were some complaints about the mix. And you say, was it like from where? And it'd be like, they all came from Winnipeg. And it was like, because <laughs> all the regional cable companies had their own way of distributing the 5 1, and sometimes you'd find they had it screwed up. And that's all cleared up now that it's being done with fiber optic. But what has been happening lately is that a lot of these shows, they want to air versions of the shows on the web two days after they're on the air. Like for, the, for example, the Junos, the, all the record companies want their stuff up there. I had assumed that they were taking our 5-1 mix and the fold down that was being done the night of the show, the CBC was doing this, and putting it on their gem channel or their web channel. But it turns out, so, so I, I came home after the Junos in March, and a couple of days later, tuned into onto the web to see what my mix sounded like on the web. And it, it didn't sound anything like it did in the truck. The vocals were way down relative to the band, like, like seriously down. And I, I was very upset, you know, because we spent hours on these sound checks trying to make it sound amazing. And it, and it turns out that um, however they're loading the stuff up on, onto the web after the fact, that algorithm is different than what was happening in the trucks the night of the show. And so um, I, one thing I've learned on the live show is that I check both the surround mix and the stereo mix during the sound checks, the two or three days of sound checks, to make sure everything's kind of working in both. But when I'm actually on the air, when the show's going out live, I'm only listening in stereo. Because I never get a... Nobody ever phones you up after the show and says, the vocals were too loud, ever. But if they're 2 dB too quiet, the phone's ringing off the hook. Like my mom's saying, I couldn't... Celine Dion was up and I couldn't make out what she's singing. And when my mom's complaining, it's... it's a, <laughs> That's a problem. So, 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 so uh, you know, like nobody's phoning up saying, "Oh, the floor tom's too loud." But, 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 but you know, it's the, it's all about the vocal. Either people are moved by the message that the singer has, or the emotional content of the singer. So, the singer is, is got to be the king of this thing, and it's it's depressing. A lot of our problems are as a result of down mixes from five one to stereo, and 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 I know that has very little to do with what we're talking about tonight, but it is, it is a loudness issue, and, and, the, and the message has to be the, the king. And so it's frustrating that after the fact that, that uh, things can change after it's left to your control, you know, and then that, that's, a, that's a frustrating thing. But, but certainly, uh, on another point, uh, just on the same sort of thing about live TV, I also work as a quality, audio quality control engineer for the Olympics, and I've done the last five Olympics. And we have a couple of control rooms there where you're sitting there at a switcher listening to 90 seconds of each event. And we're keeping an eye on a LUFS meter, um, minus 24, plus or minus 1 dB. And if any of those venues is exceeding that, we're on the phone to the guy in the truck, like immediately, like during the event, while it's going down. And they're being constantly monitored by, by engineers because they're trying to please 90 broadcasters around the world. So it's mm -hmm. taken very, very seriously in, in Olympic world uh, that, that uh, uh, ever since London, I guess, they've been trying to keep all that stuff uh, even, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's really uh, helped the overall sound of, 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 the, of the broadcast. And just one last point for Bob, uh, um, not that this has to do with loudness, but the great uh, um, mastering engineer from Toronto, Peter Moore, uh, gave a guest lecture at a school that I teach at, and one of the students put up his hand and said, uh, Peter, can you do your own mastering? Uh, uh, and uh, Peter said, well, let me put it this way. You can cut your own hair, <laughs> but but everybody will know. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I have been informed by the uh, the wizard that the power will go out in five minutes. So if there is any other question, please uh, float it now. Otherwise, three, two. Thank you to all our presenters, local. It's been a terrific evening. I'm not sure I have an answer to my question, but I feel great about it. <laughs> Thank you all. And Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. And uh, Earl, will this be up on YouTube in a day or two? Uh, yeah, I've got some issues, but it's, it'll be there. We'll
Okay, so uh, please, uh, I'll give you Earl's phone number to phone in your complaints about the YouTube audio. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.